The Abbey of Cluny was a Benedictine monastery founded 910 in what is now France. But to understand why it's significant, we need a little context first. Similar to how priests, bishops, and the Pope represent Christ's spiritual rule, often lords, kings, and the emperor represented God's secular rule by administering justice and creating order out of chaos. Close relations between secular and spiritual authorities led to lay investiture, wherein a secular ruler would appoint a religious leader to their post. Ideally, a ruler would appoint a devout person already groomed for leadership, however self-serving rulers often gave or sold church positions to family or political allies. These commoditized offices could then be sold again or even left to a family member as an inheritance, leading to ecclesiastical dynasties. From lonely monastic orders to the chair of St. Peter, there was an internal struggle for the very soul of the church. Reform-minded Christians called for an end of simony, freedom from corrupt local rulers, and clerical celibacy to end churches being passed down to children. Enter Duke William of Aquitaine. Earlier in his life, William had killed a man, and now he was concerned for his own eternal fate. Solution? Found a venerable house of prayer, an order of monks dedicated to perpetually praying to God for the souls of their founder, his family, and all Christians. In 910, William, likely with the help of Berno, wrote the charter for the Abbey of Cluny. The divine word says the riches of a man are the redemption of his soul. I, William, count and duke by the grace of God, diligently pondering this and desiring to provide for my own safety while I am still able, have considered it advisable, nay, most necessary, that from the temporal goods which have been conferred upon me, I should give some little portion for the gain of my soul. Therefore, I hand over from my own rule to the church, the town of Cluny, together with all the things pertaining to it, the villes, indeed the chapels, the serfs of both sexes, the vines, the fields, the meadows, the woods, the waters and their outlets, the mills, the incomes and revenues, what is cultivated and what is not, all in their entirety. But what if you found a house and it turns into a body house of drunkenness and debauchery? What security would William have then for his soul? They therefore needed to be strict adherence to the rule of St. Benedict. I give these things moreover with this understanding, that there the monks shall congregate and live according to the rule of St. Benedict, and that they shall possess, hold, have, and order these same things unto all time and to protect them from external corruptions, he granted Cluny full protection and autonomy in perpetuity. That they would be subject neither to our yoke, nor that of our relatives, nor the sway of royal might, nor to that of any earthly power. No one of the secular princes, no count, no bishop, whatever, not the pontiff of the aforesaid Roman see shall invade the property of these servants of God, or alienate it, or diminish it, or exchange it, or give it as a benefice to anyone, or constitute any prelate over them against their will. He also granted them exclusively the right to nominate their own abbot. After the abbot's death, those same monks shall have the power and permission to elect any one of their order whom they please as abbot and rector. The abbey attracted other reform-minded Christians and eventually started having many houses joining his daughter houses. Bruno's successor, Odo, greatly expanded the influence of Cluny, getting more rulers to acknowledge their charter and to have the same protections granted to all the daughter houses. Cluny accumulated wealth, monastic houses, and land, all untaxed. The Cluniac's discipline and education made them effective administrators, clerical reformers, and royal advisors. They had grand elaborate services that lasted all day. Such elaborate worship made them an ideal object of charity by rulers trying to curry God's favor. Many Cluniacs felt duty-bound to use their growing influence to the glory of God. They frequently negotiated peace leading to increased prosperity and increased tithes. Hugh the Great of Cluny also acted as a mediator between Pope and Emperor during the Investiture Controversy. Hugh was the apex of Cluniac power and influence, the godfather of Henry IV, and the former mentor of Pope Gregory VII, who addressed issues of simony, investiture, and clerical celibacy. Despite often mistaken for one, Gregory himself was not a Cluniac. The first Cluniac Pope was Urban II who called the First Crusade. And while talking about crusades, Cluny became so wealthy that feudal lords mortgaged land with Cluny to pay for military crusades. If these crusades were successful, Cluny was repaid with riches and relics. If not, the land went to Cluny. 
Cluniac wealth allowed for luxury that did not fit with the strictness of St. Benedict's rule. Fasting for meat is easy when you have high quality ingredients, good cooks, and lots of wine. Many feared that Cluny had lost its way. Robert of Melesme, struggling to keep discipline of a Cluniac house, founded a new abbey in Citeaux. This Cistercian order was dedicated to simplicity, charity, and manual labor, elements of St. Benedict's rule now neglected by many in Cluny. A generation later, the famous Cistercian Bernard of Clairvaux claimed, I swear, I've seen an abbot with 60 horses and more in his train. If you saw them passing, you would take them for lords with dominion over castles and counties, not for fathers of monks and shepherds of souls. He would then go on to detail and mock their luxury. Which was fair, while Hugh resisted extravagance, after his death his successor, Pons, was rumored to have embraced luxury, so much so that he was forced out of his position for this. Only to return years later with mercenaries and temporarily seize the abbey by force from Peter the Venerable. Peter was the last abbot of the Golden Age Cluny, albeit already in decline. Donations and other support had shifted towards more pious Cistercian and mendicant orders. Despite Peter's attempts at reform, after his death many houses separated from Cluny to avoid such reforms and to retain their land and wealth. The once great Cluniac empire rapidly diminished. Its reputation further sullied by its support of French interests during the Avignon Papacy until its eventual destruction during the French Revolution for its support of the monarchy, destroyed as a symbol of the very things it was founded to resist. This has been Ross von Haas and It's Saints and Stuff. If you like what we do, feel free to like or subscribe. 